This video is about one-sided limits. So for one-sided limits, let's let uh, A be some subset of the real numbers. Let's say you've got a function from A to the real numbers. So the first thing I'll tell you about, if C is some real number that's a cluster point of the set uh, A intersected with the integral from C to infinity, then we'll say that a real number L is the right-hand limit of this function at C if the following. So I've got an epsilon delta definition for you. For every epsilon, there should exist a delta. So delta depends on what that epsilon is, but epsilon, again, is supposed to be arbitrary. What we're about to say should work for any epsilon. We should be able to find a delta such that for every x that's in my domain A, where, and again, up here, I'm assuming that x is to the right of C already, so notice that uh, I don't need the absolute values here. x minus C is positive then. So such that, again, this is just trying to say x is not equal to C, but then simultaneously um, x is within delta of C. What should we have? We should have that f of x is within epsilon of L. I've got a picture for you, and by the way, uh, when we know that x is always to the right of c, we'll call this a right-hand limit, and the notation for it, you see that there's this little plus sign that's up here in like a superscript or an exponent on c, that means that your x values are to the right of c. So uh, in a picture, if I was to look over here, I tried to highlight two, a intersect c comma infinity would be this part of the real line here if that's my domain and what i'm looking at is i'm looking at what is my my uh, function doing which is in red as my x values come this way from c so i see that the limit would be whatever this y value l is here um, similarly we'll say that if c is a real number and that's a cluster point now of a intersect this interval from minus infinity to c so all we're trying to say is let's look at the points in my domain that are now to the left of c is what this is trying to say uh, then a real number l we'll call it a left hand limit of my function f at c if the following happens so for every number epsilon that's positive there should exist a delta which again will typically depend on what epsilon is such that though for every x in your domain remember x is to the left of c uh, therefore c minus x is a positive number and all this part says is that x is not equal to c and then uh, this is trying to say that x is within delta of c we should have that f of x is within epsilon of l and so the notation for a left hand limit you notice that there is this little minus sign that's a superscript on c or it looks like an exponent on c so in a picture what does this look like so now i'm trying to kind of color code things so here's the domain of my function that i care about to the left of c again is all we're trying to say uh, but then in this case if i'm looking at that piece of my graph um, it looks like the y values that uh, we're getting close to are where that yellow line L is. So as I'm coming this way with my x values, it looks like the y values want to get really, really close to that y value L. And that's the left-hand limit. So what do we have? What's the next thing I want to tell you about? How do these concepts of left and right-hand limits relate to the concept of a limit that we've been talking about? Um, so if you've got some domain A and F's a function, and let's say that C is some real number that's a cluster point of both of these sets. So the part of your domain that's to the uh, right of C, but then also the part of your domain that's to the left of C, then we can say that the limit of F of X that we're used to is equal to L if and only if both the left and the right hand limits, I guess I said that out of order, the right and the left hand limits are equal to the same number. And so let me give you an example of that. So let's look at this piecewise function. Um, f of x is 1 if x is positive, 0 if x is 0, and negative 1 if x is negative. I've got a little picture of it for you over here. And what I want to do is I want to calculate the left and the right-hand limits uh, of this function. So I claim that the right-hand limit of f is equal to 1, which probably isn't too hard to believe. If I'm coming this way with my x values towards 0, uh, then it looks like my y values are just always 1. So again, we don't care if we're actually... Um, like at zero, I don't need the y value to be um, the output of my function there, right? So like the output of my function there is zero at zero. But again, um, when I look at the x values that are really close to this, the limit is going to be one. And so to prove that for you, what do we want to do? We're going to let epsilon be some positive number. And so notice that, um, you know, any window that I was to put around uh, the number one here, right? Any window I was put around it, any epsilon, I don't really care. Like the y, the difference in the y values, like it's always one. So the difference in the y value of my function, the output, and the limit value, L, at one here, right? It would be one minus one, which is zero. And so what that's trying to say is that I don't care what window you put around uh, your deltas. I guess maybe I should go um, this way then. What window I put around my deltas, actually I should go this way, shouldn't I? 
Um, it doesn't really matter what window you put around these guys. So let's just say delta is equal to one. So let's say I went one unit length out here, right? If I was to pick any point in here and plug it in, its y value is one, but then that y value, f of x, minus the limit value, one, it's gonna be zero, which again is gonna be less than epsilon. So to kind of put that all together for us, um, what am I saying? Then for any x's that are within uh, one of zero to the right of zero, so again, if here's one that I'm looking at any x in this interval here, what do I have? I have that f of x minus one, an absolute value, well that's gonna be one minus one, which is zero, which is less than epsilon. So therefore, um, the limit as we go from the right of this function is one. Similarly, if I went from the left now, it should be negative one, which it probably isn't too hard to believe. If I'm coming this way with my x values towards zero is what this says, then what are your y values doing? Well, it looks like they're always negative one. So how would you actually prove this with the epsilon delta definition? Let's let epsilon be any positive number. And again, what we're saying is, if you're gonna put any window around this proposed limit negative one, which is right here, if I was to put any window of length epsilon around that thing, again, it doesn't really matter what window you put around zero on the left side, because for any point I pick in this window, let's say that delta is one, or I guess really be negative one, but uh, so yeah, you're right, delta would be one. Um, for um, any x value I pick in here, when I plug that into my function, you know its value is just negative one. So what are you gonna have? The difference in your y value minus what you think the limit value is, so minus negative one, that's equal to zero again. So again, that's why it really doesn't matter what delta you pick in this example. So to continue this, um, what are we gonna do? We're gonna say, let's let delta be one again, so that if I go, again, one unit over, oops, I didn't wanna do that. If I went one unit over this way, uh, then for any point that looks like zero minus x, that would be positive now, it's less than one. What are we gonna have? We're gonna have f of x minus negative one, but uh, if, if x is to the left of zero, then its output f of x should be negative one. So that's where this purple negative one's coming from. And when you subtract those two things, you get zero, but zero is less than epsilon. And so again, that proves that uh, the limit from the left of this function is negative one. So to put it all together, what did we just show? We just showed that the right-hand limit is not the same as the left-hand limit. The first one's one, the second one's negative one. Therefore, by the above, that tells me that, well, this does not happen, therefore this uh, does not happen. And in fact, what that tells me is that the limit does not exist. So the overall limit, right, the limit of this function just does not exist.